Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Jeff Sturcio on the subject of global health governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Every week on the show, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs here to the studio in Waterloo. Today, my guest is Jeff Sturcio. He is the president and CEO of Rabin Martin, a health consultancy firm based in New York. He's also the president, our former president and CEO of the Global Health Council based in Washington. Welcome to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Jeff, I wonder if we could start, could you just say a little bit about Rabin Martin? Sure. What is its mandate? Who are your clients, et cetera? Yeah, we're a, a global health consulting firm focusing on strategy and um, we look at a range of issues um, from everything from specific issues like maternal mortality and HIV AIDS uh, to um, you know how companies and foundations can do a better job of using the resources they have to improve health outcomes, particularly right. for underserved populations. And um, how long has Raven Martin been around? About 12 years. Okay. And um, what are some of the burning issues in the U.S. that, uh, that you're consulting on right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, you know, our, our practice is really um, more focused on, uh, on work outside the U.S., but right. we do do some work in the U.S. And I think that uh, you know, certainly our focus has been on the great disparities in care among different populations, right. you know, which is something that most people who follow um, what happens in the U.S. healthcare system uh, would agree is, is a major issue. Right. Now, the New York Times has reported on several occasions that despite a fairly rocky start, Obamacare has actually performed quite mm -hmm. well and perhaps even better than, than most people expected. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I'm no expert, but I, you know, I certainly have uh, have an opinion on that, as most people do. Um, you know, I think it's it's clear. Actually, just recently, the Congressional Budget Office had some new um, new figures on the estimate of how much uh, the Affordable Care Act is going to cost over the next five years. And so, one uh, one indicator of how well it's working is that that estimate is now about one third less than it was when the Affordable Care Act was passed in March of 2010. So the estimate now is that it will cost about $506 billion over the next five years. Um, another important indicator of, uh, of how well it's working is that nearly 12 million people have signed up for health insurance. Right. Uh, and that's made a big dent in the, um, you know, in the uncovered population in the U.S., which has been a major challenge uh, for the U.S. healthcare system for years. Um, and, you know, so those show that, uh, you know, as was originally um, predicted that uh, that the Affordable Care Act uh, would bend the cost curve over right. the, uh, the coming years. And so that seems to be happening from the in indicators that we have. And yet from day one, it has been under attack. Where is all of this opposition coming from? What is it rooted in? Well, uh, you know, there, there are a number of ways that you can look at this. Um, you know, one is, um, some of it is simply uh, well, it's hard to understand, let's put it that way. Um, you know, you, one often hears the criticism that uh, people want, uh, you know, particularly elderly people who are happy with Medicare, right. uh, want uh, the Obama administration to keep their hands off my Medicare. But, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense because Medicare is a government program. And, right. you know, and, uh, and by all accounts, most people are happy with the way it's working. Um, you know, I think partly um, the opposition, aside from the political issues, and I, you know, I'm really, as I said, I, I'm no expert in all of that, but it seems that some of the opposition is simply political. It came from a Democratic administration. The Republicans right. uh, would like to have a, a different approach. But um, part of it is just because the U.S. healthcare system is so enormous and so intertwined with all parts of the economy, um, and uh, because the U.S. population is generally conservative with a small c, that is, change right. is difficult to accept, sure. just the notion of completely re-engineering the health care system that affects just about everyone um, is something that, you know, people are understandably nervous about. Uh, but as I said, uh, you know, the evidence so far seems to be that it's working well. Uh, and there are a lot of things that people actually like about, uh, about Obamacare. If you look at the uh, surveys that have been done of the, you know, the general population, um, if you ask questions about things that, you know, if you ask people um, in your, you know, in, uh, in your health care insurance, would you like to have your children on the plan until they're the age uh, 26? Right. People overwhelmingly say yes. 
Um, if you ask them, uh, you know, would you like to have insurance in which there's no lifetime cap on your benefits, they overwhelmingly say yes. If you ask them, uh, would you like to have insurance in which there's no, uh, where, in which there's a prohibition against exclusion for pre-existing conditions, they overwhelmingly say yes. Right. If you ask them, are you in favor of Obamacare, you know, the, the opinion is mixed. But all of those examples I've given are right. elements of Obamacare. So, you know, right. it's just, in part, it's, you know, uh, I think that uh, people just lack information. And as I said, they're anxious about uh, something that's so important for their families. Right. Um, but I, I, I think what's happening, uh, and, you know, uh, other observers have made this point as well, is that as people see that millions of people are getting insurance who didn't have insurance before, uh, they see that the subsidies um, are working to make it more affordable, um, they see that they are getting, you know, uh, coverage for pre-existing conditions and their kids can stay on their plan for longer, that uh, the, you know, dire predictions about how insurance premiums were going to explode, uh, none of that's come true, but they are getting better access to health care Right. Coverage, um, you know, I think over time uh, the the opposition will decline, and people who are happy with uh, with the results will increase. Right. Um, moving beyond the North American context, mm -hmm. uh, globally, what are the big health issues that we as a global community are facing right now? Well, there, uh, you know, it's interesting to uh, to pose the question in that way because. Right. You know, the challenges we face in global health are so varied and, and so daunting in some ways right. uh, that, that often people will just focus on one or other particular um, uh, topic of, of interest to them or uh, that they're more, most concerned about. I think overall the big challenge is that um, if you look at a planet that has 7 billion people uh, and still a couple of billion people living in, in extreme poverty, right. the biggest challenge is what are we going to do to ensure that all seven billion people uh, have access to, um, you know, a, a basic package of care, right. and that's really the uh, the impetus behind or the um, uh, the issue behind uh, the move to universal health coverage, which the, uh, the UN uh, adopted as a uh, an aspiration a couple of years ago, and which countries are now in the process of. Uh, of working toward. You know, in Canada, of course, uh, you know, you've had use universal health coverage with a single-payer system for, right. for some time. That's right. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, Canada, the uh, National Health Service in the UK. These are some of the models that, um, you know, that policymakers have been looking at. Now, of course, the challenge, uh, and this gets back to the big issue, is that, um, you know, most countries uh, where the seven billion people live don't have the level of resources right. that a Canada or the UK have. Uh, and, and also, let's face it, you know, we were just talking about Obamacare in the U.S., so one of the wealthiest countries in the world hasn't been able to achieve universal health coverage. So you have to ask yourself, well, how will other countries do it? Right. Um, and I think that, you know, partly it will be through defining uh, a package of care, uh, that is, um, you know, what kinds of conditions will be covered, how much will they be covered, uh, you know, will there be uh, access to different kinds of surgery as well as uh, treatment for chronic disease, and you know, there are a whole range of conditions. Um, but it really requires a, uh, a complete sea change in the way in which politicians and policymakers think about um, the obligations and responsibilities they have to the populations who put them in office uh, right. and how they're going to do the best job they can with the resources available of getting maximum health for the money that, that they can invest. And to what extent are the current global institutions that deal with health um, and I would include foundations mm -hmm. in that category as well. To what extent are they able to help state governments provide mm -hmm. or deliver this basic level of care? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, this is a, um, a really complex and sort of uh, me uh, messy problem. It really is uh, because, you know, we're, f just think of, of the challenge. You've got, um, you know, billions of people around the world, many of them, most of them, in fact, living in countries with um, uh, relati relatively straightened economic resources. And then, you know, others in countries like China and India, where, you know, two-sevenths of the world population live, um, you know, have uh, extreme um, disparities in what the wealthy versus the poor are able to do. Right. You know, and as, as um, you know, it's often been observed, there are more poor people in uh, in emerging markets and wealthy countries now than there are in, in poor countries or developing countries. Right. So that remains a, a challenge for the global system. And so what's happening now is that um, people are trying to get a handle on, you know, what do the challenges look like in individual countries? What resources do they have available? 
uh, and where can they get help, both in terms of technical assistance and, um, and uh, you know, um, foreign assistance uh, to help meet the gap between what they're able to provide now and what their population actually needs. Um, and at the same time, there's been a change, um, a concomitant change in the way in which global institutions look at governing the system of provision of health care. So, you know, let's just go back to when the, the World Health Organization was, um, was instituted in the late 1940s. Right. That was a world in which you had the World Health Organization as the central institution for providing, you know, both normative standards and technical assistance in global health, and its budget was commensurate with the challenges it faced. Um, and they tended to deal with other, with governments. It was largely an intergovernmental organization. Um, and, you know, that's the sort of world we had uh, back in the late 1940s. Now, if you fast forward to now, um, the World Health Organization um, is undergoing its own reform process. But what's become clear is, and, and we saw this in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa right. recently, what's become clear is that the World Health Organization um, has such has expanded its mandate, or I should say, the member states have expanded its mandate so much over the last few decades that they don't have anywhere near the resources they need to achieve right. all the things they've been um, asked to do. Uh, and at the same time, the landscape has changed dramatically because um, if you look at um, you know the the resources available, the money available for global health, um, you know countries themselves uh, don't, or in the developing world and emerging markets. Uh, don't actually provide all of the money that, that they need right. themselves from domestic resources. So you have tremendous flows of billions of dollars every year from donor uh, countries. But now what's interesting is that the financial flows are not just from donor countries. So this, you know, the notion that um, you know, had a world in which you had donor countries and recipient countries and that together with the domestic resources of recipient countries, you could cover all the issues that you needed to. You know, now you've got, for instance, um, a world in which remittances from populations who have left developing countries to go right. live in the North um, are greater than the flow of, of official development assistance. Uh, and in which, uh, for instance, uh, you now have an institution like the Gates Foundation, um, which has a budget uh, for its grants every year, which is greater than the assessed contributions of the, Glo of the World Health Organization. Uh, and, and at the same time, you've also got uh, a proliferation of other institutions that are doing parts of the work that were left decades ago to the World Health Organization and governments. Right. So you have uh, public-private partnerships, you, ha you know, like uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, the Global Fund Against AIDS, TB, and Malaria, the Stop TB Partnership, the Rollback Malaria Partnership. There are just literally right. dozens of these organizations that are taking over aspects of the work that used to be done just by governments and the World Health Organization. Right. You know, and I'm just speaking about global health right now. So what hasn't happened, uh, you know, at the same time that we have this gap between um, the aspiration that governments uh, have to provide universal health coverage for the seven billion people on the planet right. um, and, the, um, and the available resources, you also have a challenge in that we haven't figured out how this new complex network of right of public-private organizations, non-governmental organizations, foundations, uh, and public-private partnerships is actually going to coordinate its efforts to actually achieve uh, the results we'd like to see, which is to, um, re, um, you know, uh, let me just uh, stop there for a minute because I, I lost a word. Sure. You know, what, what we have is we haven't figured out how those uh, complex new organizations are going to coordinate their work to erase the uh, gap between uh, what those who need healthcare coverage uh, actually have and what they need. Right. So it, um, you know, it's just as I said before, it's uh, you know, it's what um, some economists and and uh, others call a wicked problem uh, right. because it's just so complicated. It's hard to see what the solution is. Well, and perhaps we could focus a little bit on this question of public-private partnerships. Now, mm -hmm. you've been involved with uh, one very successful one in Botswana, the mm -hmm. HAP initiative. Um, could you say a little bit about this? Sure, sure. I, you know, I think that uh, you know there have been um, literally hundreds of public-private partnerships right. in health um, developed over the last uh, twenty years, and the uh, the one the project in Botswana that you uh, you mentioned was one I was involved in when I used to work for Merck Sharp and Doma, a large uh, pharmaceutical company. It's known as Merck Frost here in Canada. Right. And the uh, the idea uh, this was set up in two thousand. Uh, the idea was at the time that we looked at um, at setting up this partnership, um, 
countries in Africa were really facing uh, you know, a, an extremely challenging uh, future with uh, respect to the AIDS epidemic, which seemed at the time, frankly, to be out of control. Right. You know, there were tens of millions of people infected. Uh, the number of infections was increasing every year. Deaths from AIDS were increasing every year. Um, and there were you know, some efforts to deal with it, um, led by UN AIDS. Um, but it just seemed that, that African countries weren't getting much traction in actually addressing prevention of new infections as well as treatment of those who are already infected. Uh, and and uh, you know, by that time, pharmaceutical companies uh, in around 2000 had begun to come up with triple combination therapy that actually provided uh, the prospect of long-term treatment that could turn AIDS into a chronic disease uh, from right. what was essentially a death sentence. Um, but still, uh, you know, the available resources were out of sync with where the problem was, uh, and there was a lack of coordination of all the different efforts that were being made to address parts of the problem. So um, I, I was at MSD at the time, and we thought, what if you went to a country, and Botswana was the country we chose, in part because at the time it had the highest um, prevalence rate among adults of any right. country in the world. We said, what if you went to a country like Botswana and said, instead of just dealing with, uh, you know, uh, focusing on prevention, instead of just trying to ensure that more people get antiretroviral treatment, what if you dealt with the entire spectrum of issues in prevention, care, treatment, uh, of HIV and AIDS, and that would go from stigma and discrimination at the community level to ensuring that people uh, change their behavior right. uh, and engaged in less risky sexual practices, um, that the government actually was testing people to find out who had HIV and then was making uh, the appropriate treatment resources available. And we also um, thought that it would be uh, useful to work together with the government and also with another partner who could bring other resources and expertise to bear on this. And so we went to the Gates Foundation and asked them if they would be interested in collaborating. Uh, and so this program was set up in 2000. Uh, the Gates Foundation and, and Merck and Company each put in $50 million. And the idea was over the next 10 years, let's try this comprehensive approach um, to uh, HIV uh, uh, prevention, care, and treatment in Botswana. Uh, and the results were, uh, you know, now this, this idea of taking a comprehensive approach of partnerships in the fight against AIDS is something that's become commonplace. Right. You know, PEPFAR, the U.S. President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, which has now treated something like uh, 7 million people for HIV and AIDS uh, in the countries that it's focused in, um, you know, has something like 700 partnerships with uh, private sector entities and others uh, in different aspects of, of what they've been doing in Africa and elsewhere in the world. Uh, so now it's become a common approach, but then this was really um, the only example you could point right. to in which a government, a foundation, and a company were collaborating to try to um, really change the course of the epidemic uh, in, in Botswana. And the results have been dramatic. Um, you know, Botswana was the first country in Africa to reach universal coverage, which was a, right. a major goal of the 3 by 5 initiative of the World Health Organization. Um, at the time that uh, we started, something like two out of five babies born to HIV positive mothers were HIV positive. Uh, but now they have almost universal coverage for pre prevention of maternal fetal transmission. And the percentage of babies born HIV positive has gone from 40% to less than 4%, which wow. is really a dramatic change. And, you know, I, there are a number of other indicators like that, but, you know, this, this approach of bringing together public and private partners, um, you know, with the government leading the way, uh, you know, it was really uh, the government's uh, strategic plan for how to deal with HIV. Um, the Botswana government has done a good job of coordinating its development partners in this, and PEPFAR was a major focus. I mean, there are plenty of, uh, of actors who were, uh, were partners in this, but, you know, that partnership really was the catalyst that led to those outcomes. And I, I think it's, it shows how powerful that kind of partnership can be because uh, working together, uh, you know, the, the government of Botswana wasn't able to solve this problem on its own. Right. And working together with the Gates Foundation and Merck and many other partners, they were able to bring together um, the complementary uh, skills and resources that were needed to really make a difference. Right. Well, and I wonder if we could maybe talk about indicators for mm -hmm. a few moments. And could you say a little bit about the uh, Global Burden of Disease Report, uh, the one that came out in, in 2013, and mm -hmm. what it tried to measure and, and perhaps some of its findings? Yeah, well, it, it, uh, you know, you're referring to uh, the, um, the Lancet Commission report called right. Global Health 2035. And you know, that was based on an analysis of, uh, of a really remarkable database that the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation 
uh, at the University of Washington has constructed over, over the past few years, in which they look at you know, um, something close to 200 different um, conditions and uh, in uh, you know, every country in the world, basically, and are trying to get a sense of you know, what are the trends, what are people dying from, what are the greatest sources of morbidity, and right. you know, uh, really um, to get a sense of uh, you know, what's the evidence base for what needs to be done to improve global health around the world. Uh, and in Global Health 2035, the argument that they made was that with, um, with greater concentration on a relatively small number of interventions, um, we could actually make it possible uh, by 2035 for there to be a, a, what they called a grand convergence between the state of health in developed countries and the state of health in developing countries. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that um, Although there's been a lot of attention in the past uh, couple of decades to infectious disease like HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, um, actually the global burden of disease is one in which um, the majority of the deaths actually come from chronic diseases or what are known as non-communicable diseases. Uh, and the four major non-communicable diseases are diabetes, uh, respiratory uh, disease, cardiovascular disease and different forms of cancer. Right. Uh, and so it used to be that people thought that if you lived in a developing country, um, you died of AIDS, TB, or malaria, or other infectious diseases. Right. And if you lived in a country like Canada or the United States, you might die of a heart attack or of breast cancer or lung cancer or uh, you know, some other chronic condition. Uh, but the fact is that um, what's happened is there's been uh, a demographic transition in the last several decades in which the uh, you know, infectious disease is still a problem, but there's been so much effort to deal with infectious disease uh, that, you know, HIV infections are now declining rather than increasing. Um, right. Millions fewer people are dying from malaria than used to die from malaria. And, you know, there, so there's been progress in those areas. But at the same time, uh, the countries that have had a heavy burden of disease, uh, infectious disease, such as uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, have an equally heavy burden of chronic disease now. So right. that uh, and, and because the resources haven't been put into chronic disease in the way that they have into infectious disease, what you have are um, uh, increasingly uh, large disparities in outcomes. Uh, you know, for instance, if a child in Canada uh, has leukemia, they have a, uh, something like a 90% chance of living to the age of five. If a child in most of Africa has leukemia, um, their chance of, uh, you know, is something like 5% uh, of right. living to the, you know, they have a 90% chance of dying before the age of five. So, um, you know, and those disparities are just becoming even starker as we understand more about the impact and the burden of, of these chronic conditions in, in, uh, in developing countries and emerging markets. You know, right now, um, something like three-fifths of deaths around the world are caused by chronic conditions. Uh, and, and of those 60% of deaths around the world, uh, four out of five are in developing countries. So it right. just shows how that uh, burden is distributed. And, and I think, you know, the challenge now is uh, to figure out how we can reorient the resources that have been going to other areas. Um, you know, the estimate, um, th there was an estimate a couple of years ago from the Center on Global Development that um, only about 3% of all of the work, uh, excuse me, all of the money that uh, has, goes to health for, um, through overseas or official development assistance, only about 3% of that was for chronic disease. Uh, and all the rest was for other right. things, um, you know, that, uh, you know, all of which are important, but, <laughs> but when you look at the burden of disease, there really right. needs to be a re reorientation. And of course, these chronic diseases also have um, implications for economic development. It's not sure. just that they cause morbidity and mortality among populations, but, um, you know, David Bloom from Harvard uh, and some colleagues did an estimate a few years ago um, that uh, suggested that uh, between now and 2030, uh, the global economy would uh, have something like $47 trillion in economic losses if the burden of chronic disease wow. wasn't dealt with more effectively. You know, and a large part of that uh, uh, comes from mental health, which actually wasn't even included in the, um, the core uh, chronic diseases when the WHO um, uh, you know, took a look at this and began to establish uh, um, uh, programs to really address non-communicable diseases in the aftermath of the uh, 2011 uh, high-level meeting on non-communicable diseases at the UN, uh, when this was taken on as a uh, as a global priority, um, so there's you know there just is a lot that uh, is still left to be done. The good news, uh, you know, so I don't want this to sound <laughs> completely bleak. Right. The good news is that many of these chronic diseases are preventable. 
Um, right. And so if we simply do a better job of encouraging people to change behaviors, to exercise more, not to smoke, not to abuse alcohol, uh, and, um, and also to eat well, and you know, just not eat junk food all the time, but, uh, but have more healthy diets, um, a large part of that burden of disease can be avoided. Right. Uh, and so, and, and you know, the other part, the reason that that's good news is that it doesn't actually cost as much sure. to persuade people to change their behaviors as it does to treat the outcomes of, uh, you know, of those behaviors left unchecked. So it, um, you know, and of course there's still part of that burden that can't be uh, avoided uh, just because of, of these behaviors, but a large chunk of it can. And so, right. you know, and in fact, to get back to the question you posed about uh, Global Health 2035, the report in The Lancet, um, their conclusion is that the single biggest thing that could be done uh, to improve uh, the outcomes and to actually encourage movement toward that grand convergence in which developing countries and developed countries will both have uh, you know, healthier populations uh, is to really um, press the, uh, the need to regulate tobacco more right. effectively uh, and to implement the um, recommendations of the uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, and that alone would have a dramatic impact on health outcomes around the world. Right. I wonder if we might end off by uh, focusing on the health story that probably got the most attention in 2014 and continues to uh, be an ongoing crisis, and that's the Ebola crisis of, that, that hit West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, is it too soon to draw some lessons from that experience and the global response to that particular mm -hmm. crisis? Well, I, no, I think there are some lessons that can be drawn, and uh, you know, again, I, you know, I don't want to um, presume to uh, present myself as an expert on all of this. I haven't right. been in West Africa recently, uh, and I wasn't directly involved in any of the response. But you know, just in um, in following closely what happened and in, in reflecting on this in the context of you know these issues that uh, that we've been working on over the last couple of decades. Uh, you know, I think there, there are a few key conclusions. One is, and, and this is actually analogous to the point I was just making about prevention in global right. health. Uh, you know, had, uh, had the WHO and the rest of the global community mobilized sooner, um, the, uh, the human consequences of that outbreak would not have been as great. Um, you know, it was, uh, the first cases uh, occurred at the very end of 2013. It wasn't until August of 2014 uh, that right. The WHO declared it an international health emergency, uh, and then you know within a couple of months of that declaration, all of a sudden uh, you know you had the U.S. sending 3,000 troops, you had the U.K. and France right. and others. Security Council. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it was taken. So it really was taken up then as a priority, uh, and and you know I don't want to to um, uh, denigrate the progress that was made because you know at that time uh, in August and September of last year, people were. Um, were uh, predicting that there might be as many as a million people affected, or more than a million people right. affected in those in that region, uh, and that you know those predictions never came true. That uh, you know because the number of people affected was, uh, you know, in the tens of thousands, and and that was as a consequence of actually taking those actions, uh, and implementing um, you know some of the basic public health precautions that were required for an epidemic outbreak like that. So that's one thing that you know had had uh, action been mobilized sooner, um, the the course of the outbreak might have been handled um, you know, more um, efficiently and with, uh, with fewer um, people dying in the end. Um, but the, the second thing is that uh, you know, the experts who have been looking at this, and that involves uh, you know, people uh, like David Nabarro, who led the UN's response, and Tom Frieden, the head of CDC in, uh, in, in the US, uh, Peter Piot, who was one of the co-discoverers of the Ebola virus and who has been active in, in thinking about uh, how to um, improve the response to this right. outbreak and many others, um, is that you know, there were certain basic public health uh, precautions that, that the public health community has known about for years in which you, know, you isolate the people who are, who are infected, you trace their contacts, and then make sure that you monitor those contacts uh, you know, for the 21 days to see yep. if they've actually developed Ebola. Um, and, you know, had that been done more systematically, again, it, you know, it probably would have even moderated the outbreak. But the challenge was that, uh, and, and this is the third, uh, the third point, um, that the health infrastructures in the countries that were most directly affected, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and, and uh, Liberia, um, were really, uh, there's no easy way to say this, they were very weak because right. You know, of a, uh, you know, because of, of conflict situations and they were still, re um, you know, the economies were recovering, the government was recovering, 
the society in general was recovering from uh, years of conflict in some cases. And let's face it, these are still relatively poor countries, so they simply didn't have the kind of healthcare infrastructure that, uh, that, you know, that would have been required to implement those public health um, uh, measures. And then also, uh, you know, this, this uh, legacy of conflict and, um, uh, and having weak governments uh, in, in recent years right. also led people, you know, the population to be uh, skeptical and sometimes hostile to, to government. And so, you know, and, you know, there's even been analysis of uh, the outbreak being in, um, in parts of the country in, in these countries where uh, opposition politicians uh, you know, came from, and so the government, uh, you know, some people have argued that the governments may not have moved as quickly as they might sure. have otherwise. You know, I don't know if, uh, you know, how, how much credence to put in those kinds of rumors, but, but the point is that, uh, you know, you had weak healthcare infrastructure, you had governments that were just barely hanging on, you know, because of the impact of, of the outbreak, right. uh, and then you have this residual kind of uh, skepticism and even hostility toward government action. So, so that kind of is, a, is just a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, but, but again, the bright side is that you know, now Liberia appears to be Ebola-free. Um, yep. you know, the, uh, the number of infections has been declining uh, over the, the, uh, you know, the past couple of months in, uh, in Guinea and Sierra Leone, and it looks like the, um, you know, the help that the, the global community has been able to give to those three countries has turned the tide on the epidemic. But the, the, and, and also, I should say that um, you know, there's been a, um, a really dramatic effort on the part of a number of pharmaceutical companies, including uh, uh, Merck Sharp and Dome and GlaxoSmithKline and, and uh, Janssen uh, to uh, put new candidate Ebola vaccines into clinical trials right. much more rapidly than uh, has, has usually right. been done. You know, and that's been uh, a result of collaboration with the WHO and with regulatory authorities uh, around the world. Um, I just read that uh, uh, the, um, the Merck uh, um, vaccine candidate is going to go into phase three trials in Guinea fairly soon. So, right. so okay. that's moving along very quickly okay. and you know, hopefully that will lead to uh, vaccines that will be helpful for the next, uh, the next outbreak. Sure. But I, I think the other uh, lesson to be learned from this is that you know, there have been um, Ebola outbreaks uh, regularly in Africa over the last uh, uh, several years. Um, and this one was different in that it was the first time that it actually came into urban populations. Uh, but, you know, there's probably, I, I uh, uh, Strive Masaiwa, who's the head of Econet Wireless and has been, uh, he's special envoy for the African Union right. on the business response to Ebola in Africa. Um, you know, he, uh, he observed when I, I had a chance to talk to him recently that there's probably another Ebola out outbreak in Africa right now. You know, it just hasn't come to light yet. It probably is in some, you know, uh, uh, far, you know, some rural area, which is, is more, um, uh, you know, more a, a traditional route for the outbreaks to, to happen. Uh, but the lesson that we have to learn is next time we have to be prepared to apply the lessons of this Ebola outbreak. Right. Jeff, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. And thank you to our audience. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. That, uh, that the Affordable Care Act uh, would bend the cost curve over right. the, uh, the coming years. And so that seems to be happening from the in indicators that we have. And yet from day one, it has been under attack. Where is all of this opposition coming from? What is it rooted in? Well, uh, you know, there, there are a number of ways that you can look at this. Um, you know, one is, um, some of it is simply uh, well, it's hard to understand, let's put it that way. Um, you know, you, one often hears the criticism that uh, people want, uh, you know, particularly elderly people who are happy with Medicare, right. uh, want uh, the Obama administration to keep their hands off my Medicare. But, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense because Medicare is a government program. And, right. you know, and, uh, and by all accounts, most people are happy with the way it's working. Um, you know, I think partly uh, the opposition, aside from 12 years. Okay. And... Um, what are some of the burning issues in the U.S. that uh, that you're consulting on right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, you know our our practice is really uh, more focused on uh, on work outside the U.S., but right. we do do some work in the U.S. And I think that uh, you know certainly our focus has been on the great disparities in care among different populations, right. you know, which is something that most people who follow um, what happens in the U.S. healthcare system uh, would agree is is a major issue. Right. 
Now, the New York Times has reported on several occasions that despite a fairly rocky start, Obamacare has actually performed quite mm -hmm. well and perhaps even better than, than most people expected. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I'm no expert, but I, you know, I certainly have, uh, have an opinion on that as most. Here to the studio in Waterloo. Today my guest is Jeff Sturcho. He is the president and CEO of Rabin Martin, a health consultancy firm based in New York. He's also the president, our former president and CEO of the Global Health Council based in Washington. Welcome to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Jeff, I wonder if we could start, could you just say a little bit about Rabin Martin? Sure. What is its mandate? Who are your clients, et cetera? Yeah, we're a, a global health consulting firm focusing on strategy and um, we look at a range of issues um, from everything from specific issues like maternal mortality and HIV AIDS uh, to um, you know how companies and foundations can do a better job of using the resources they have to improve health outcomes, particularly right. for underserved populations. And um, w how long has Raven Martin been around? Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Jeff Sturcio on the subject of global health governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow here at the Centre for International Governance and Innovation. Every week on the show, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. People do. Um, you know, I think it's, it's clear, actually, just recently, the Congressional Budget Office had some new, um, new figures on the estimate of how much uh, the Affordable Care Act is going to cost over the next five years. And so one, uh, one indicator of how well it's working is that that estimate is now about one-third less than it was when the Affordable Care Act was passed in March of 2010. So the estimate now is that it will cost about $506 billion over the next five years. Um, another important indicator of, uh, of how well it's working is that nearly 12 million people have signed up for health insurance. Right. Uh, and that's made a big dent in the, um, you know, in the uncovered population in the U.S., which has been a major challenge uh, for the U.S. healthcare system for years. Um, and, you know, so those show that, uh, you know, as was originally um, predicted. 